Hi, this is Scott Garibay, and today I want to talk about Duns and Dragons, and I want to talk about the film Bob Marley, One Love, which uh, released on February 14th, 2024. I saw it on opening day, which is very exciting, and I want to, uh, and I have seen the film, and now I want to explore what the Dungeon Master lesson is from Bob Marley, One Love, and what the Dungeon Performer lesson is from Bob, Lar Bob Marley, One Love. All right, so let's jump into this. So, uh, oh, and by the way, spoilers for um, a man's life who ended in 1981. Uh, so, like, I, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> is, there, is that spoilers? It's 40 years old, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, it's 40. Wow. It's over 40 years old. So, spoilers for all of Bob Marley, One Love here. All right, so it's interesting. So first of all, let me explain um, my experience with Bob Marley. Uh, so first of all, I'm not really a fan of Bob Marley or his music <laughs> in any way. So why did I go see this movie? Well, I am a big, big fan of American cinema. I, I absolutely love American cinema. And um, I go to the movies, and I really like movies. I am, a, I am a fan of American film, right? And that has grown significantly for me um, over the years to the point now where um, I really enjoy my time. I, I can't remember the last time I was in a film that I did not enjoy just watching it in the movies. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One, um, I go to the movies a lot, and uh, there's a lot of empty seats all the time, right? And so I kind of feel like I'm, I'm witnessing the end of something incredible, and so I really uh, value every time I'm in the seat. I don't know, you know, get in the seat. Or like I, I think that's a, that's a part of life right now is like, what seat are you sitting in? Where are you sitting, right? Like, I think actually, and, um, yeah, and you're like, Scott, shouldn't you be standing more? Hey, man, if you didn't see the movie Fight Club, <laughs> Fight Club said it very clearly. <laughs> people who work sitting down make a lot more money than people who work standing up, right? And so you're like, well, but movies are just for enjoyment. No, actually, I don't think so. I actually really think that uh, we are, we've reached a part, we've reached a point in American history where, um, uh, yeah, I think this is really important to understand. I think we've reached a point in American history where... It really matters. Um, it matters a lot where you spend every moment, uh, and I think the entertainment we take in can really transform the way we, the way. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I was about to say the way we think. No, 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 no. Right. Um, I think once you understand Dungeons and Dragons, you start. I've been thinking a lot of you know thinking a lot about Dungeons and Dragons. I know that sounds strange for me to say, but I actually have been thinking a lot about Dungeons and Dragons, and I believe that part of being a dungeon master or a dungeon performer is starting to understand emotion, sagacity, and knowledge, okay? So the rest of the world concerns itself with how we, how it thinks. I think a dungeon master and a, an engaged dungeon performer thinks about how they feel, how they gather wisdom, how they receive, how they receive emotion, how they receive wisdom, and how they receive knowledge. It's not enough to just say the way I think. Yeah, regular muggles, you know, the, the, the undungeoned, the undragoned, they worry about how they think. Once you've experienced the dungeon, once you've experienced the dragon, you start to think about how you feel, how you receive emotion, how you receive wisdom, how you receive knowledge, and you seek the correct conduits, the correct channels for all of it at all times. And the reason why is you are a world builder. You don't have time for frivolity. You don't have time for fun. You don't have time to watch bad films, right? Like, you have to stay, you have to be on the cream, at the cream. You have to be at the top, right, where the froth is. I, I think a lot about this, and you know, because 
We have to live up to Gary's legacy. We have to try. We have to try. Most of us will fail. I'm sure I'll fail to live up Gary up to Gary's legacy. I'm not positive of that. I think I will fail to live up to the legacy of Gary Gygax. But I'm going to try. I'm going to try to match it. Right? I'm going to try so that when I leave here, people will remember I was here and I had something to say. Right? And I thought differently. That, and I, I stood for progressiveness. And I stood for equality. That I stood for justice, freedom, and unity. Exactly the way Gary did. Right? So I went to this film and I saw saw Bob Marley, um, One Love, and I was really not a fan of him. So, but I went because I'm a huge fan of American cinema, right? And when I watched the trailer, I was like, "That looks like a good movie," <laughs> and it was five out of five star film. Absolutely love this film. Um, I got a lot. I walked away. I, I walked out with a clear Dungeon Master lesson and a clear Dungeon Performer lesson. I am both. I am a dungeon master, and I'm a terrible dungeon performer. Uh, but I am a world-class dungeon master, but I am not a good dungeon performer. But I pay attention to both lessons. Alright, so let's dig in. So thank you for your patience. I know kind of uh, went down a different path there. But that's okay. Bob Marley was, you know, part of the film was you got to switch it up, right? Like, you got to know when your new album is coming out, and you have to think differently and do differently. You cannot do the same thing you did before, right? And I think that's what that's why we keep get that's why we get a new D and D canon hardback every three months, right? We gotta we gotta change the game, right? We gotta we have to change the experience, right? All right. So what is the dungeon master lesson from Bob Marley, One Love? Okay. All right. Bob Marley. Uh, first of all, I did not know Bob Marley had a white father and an African-American mother. Uh, I'm sorry, Jamaican-American mother. Actually, he had a white father and a Jamaican mother. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your patience there. All right. I did not know that. I, I thought he was... I thought <laughs> I thought he was African-American. I In my head, you know, I was like, oh, J Bob Marley is African-American. And this movie really was like, stop, think, understand the history, right? You know? Um, and it was helpful. It was very helpful, right? So... He had a white father and a Jamaican mother. Right? He grew up in, in Kingston, Jamaica, and they called it a concrete jungle. And the moment they used that language, I was like, oh, I know what that is, right? Like, um, I spent some time in Chicago uh, uh, it was a, when I was young. And so the moment they said concrete jungle, I knew what that was. Um, I did not have the the struggles that um, Bob Marley had, but he grew up in a in a concrete jungle, and it was uh, it was difficult. It was very hard for him, right? So, um, so he he starts making his music. He plays in Jamaica, and his his music echoes out to the world, right? He then gets a, a white producer. <laughs> um, who really puts him on blast, right? And then uh, he does, I think he does his first album, and then Exodus was one of his subsequent albums, right? So he's already got his first album out, and he wants to do something really spectacular. So he goes to make this uh, this album Exodus. And uh, they said at the end of the movie that Exodus is, was called by Time Magazine the number one album of the 20th century. And I believe that. I, I definitely, because I certainly knew, even though I wasn't a fan of Bob Marley, I certainly knew his music, right? I, I had heard it before. I didn't know his music. I had heard it before. And I also knew that they were stadium anthems. You could put people in a stadium and uh, and sing those songs, and everybody in the, sta in the stadium could sing the chorus at least, right? Pretty interesting. Okay. So he goes to uh, London, to record Exodus, right? Leaves his home, leaves Jamaica to, to do his best work, right? Interesting. And I think I think there's a lesson in there that, you know, as adventurers, our adventurers and Dungeons and Dragons, they journey. What do you accomplish if you're not journeying, right? You have to move, right? But the Dungeon Master lesson that I caught was um, 
So he goes to he goes to London and he starts recording Exodus, and he's already got his band from Jamaica. And these guys, you know, they play drums, they play guitar, um, they know what they're doing. They're competent, right? maybe even they're spectacular. But they bring in this uh, this psychedelic electric guitar guy who does not sound Irie, does not sound Jamaican, does not sound like reggae in any way, and he's got this incredible talent with almost like a, a psychedelic electric guitar sound that really makes Bob Marley's music pop, right? And they called him Junior, right? And um, and but Bob Marley is concerned when he talks to um, Junior, and he's like, "Hey, you got to understand what we're putting down here." And uh, and the guy's like, "Well, you know, I love music." We can both vibe on music. We can both connect on music. And he's like, um, you know, we can, the music can be the thing, right? And Bob Marley can corrects him and says, no, no. Uh, and, and, he, and he's like, actually, the guy says, this guy says to Bob, he says, I can do the music, you can do the message, right? And Bob Marley says, no, there's no division. There's no division between those two things. The music is the message. The music is the message. And I paid attention to this film, and I think the message that Bob Marley was trying to get across is justice, freedom, and unity. All right? You could, uh, if you know Bob Marley's music, if you know Bob Marley's life, if you know this film, you could tell me if you think I'm right or wrong about that. Right? But I think that was the message that he was trying to get across: justice, freedom, unity. Right? Those three things. Right? I and I. Okay. But. As the dungeon master, as the dungeon master, is the narrative the message? Can the narrative be the message? Do we have a message? Do we have a message that we're trying to give to each person at the table? Right? Do we have a message? All right. So let's talk about that, right? Is that possible? Can the narrative be the message? By the way, in my humble opinion, the most powerful catalyst that happens when we sit at the table, right? I sit in the American theater. I do it right now, right? Sentinel, right? Sitting on the wall, watching for something that's going to try to break the wall down. I go because I don't want it to end. I go to the movies all the time, right? Because I want... I want my grandchildren to watch movies in a theater, in an American theater, right? I sit in the Dungeon Master's seat to honor Gary, to honor his legacy, to make sure it doesn't die, to make sure it's relevant today, right? And I crack Dungeons and Dragons now books to, to honor Gary. Crack in 1980, dusty tomes, blowing the dust off at a few, you know, at a few players around your table don't, does not honor Gary. Does not So, the most powerful catalyst that comes from the Dungeon Master, right, is the narrative. The narrative. We write it, we bring it, and we abandon it. So can our narrative be our message if we're abandoning it at the first divergence from the players. I think the narrative can be the message. Even though we have to abandon it the moment a player sets it sets the narrative in a new direction. Okay? The the flow of the Dungeon Dragons table is very specific, right? And we set we set the narr- we, we write the narrative down, we bring it to the table. We set it into place at the beginning. And then we break it. We break the narrative the minute even a single player goes in a different direction. So how can the narrative be the message? I think it can. And the reason why is the narrative is carried in the notes we bring to the table. But it's also carried in our life, in our actual meat sack life. What are we doing in life? right? We are giving a narrative to the players in that way, right? 
when we open our home, when we're there every week, when the game can be relied upon, right? The other thing is we have a thousand non-player characters, right? I'm a huge Lego fan. There's the stud and there's the anti-stud, right? There is the villain and the hero. They, the villain can represent the narrative by opposing it. So just because, you know, the narrative has been turned by the player doesn't mean it won't come up again cyclically, right? And then also the narrative can come forward in the other seats that we take, right? When we go to a basketball game with one of the players and we're just talking about it. And that way, if you can sell your narrative away from the table, your players might reintroduce it to the table, right? But the narrative is going to be interrupted. It is going to be interrupted. But that won't mean... The, narr the narrative will be interrupted, but that doesn't mean the, the message will be forgotten. The message can be brought back, almost like a rhythm, right? So I believe that the narrative can be the message exactly the way Bob Marley set it into place. So I told you at the, at the beginning of this that I would tell you the Dungeon Master lesson and the Dungeon Performer lesson. I lied! I apologize. That was my intention. But the narrative took place and I needed more time to, to explain um, that the narrative can be the message. That just like Bob Marley's music was the message, I think the narrative can be the message. Every single word you just heard is my humble opinion. Nothing more, nothing less. What's important is when I hear your humble opinion. You the people. Please consider liking and subscribing and have a fetch millennium.